So now uh, I'm switching to English so that uh, everybody, including Professor Belting, can understand. Uh, this book is uh, one of the books of Professor Belting. He started his professional career as an art historian in Byzantine studies. And uh, books such as uh, Likeness and Presence, A History of the Image Before the Era of Art, is a crucial book for Byzantine studies, but it also it's, it's a book that, that is a, the foundation for the anthropology of the images. Then he wrote a book, uh, The Invisible Masterpiece, which is a fantastic book. Some of these books you can find here on the table, maybe just to touch or to see. Um, then there is um, uh, The End of History of Art, one of the earliest books and the early essay, which, which made his name in practice uh, in, 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 in a field different from Byzantine uh, art studies. And uh, the, the most recent books, Florence and Baghdad, Renaissance Art and Arab Science, which explores the origin uh, and the connections uh, between the um, Arab world and, and, and their, their scientific advances uh, in connection to um, the, the theory and practice of perspective, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then we go to the anthropology of images. The, the most fun, this is how I will end my introduction and give the, the floor to, to Professor Belting. The most crucial aspect of this book, in my view, is that it provides a bridge between visual art, art and visual, visual culture. It expands the field of art in an incredible way. This book and, and, and the writings of Professor Belting, uh, it has already been mentioned here, are explicitly the foundation of the last of this year's uh, Venice Biennial, uh, Im, uh, implicitly behind the documenta from a year ago, and, in, and, and he has influenced many other curators in their practice of, uh, of making exhibitions. The crucial aspect is that he introduces the notion of the mental image, because usually we think of uh, pictures or sculptures as, as embodied in some sort of medium and material. We, don't, we, we think of them separate, separated as material entities, separated from our perception. Uh, in, in, in these books, it, it, what, it, what it explores is, is the, the mental images which are housed by the body, which is a living medium, and uh, this body of, uh, which is housing the, 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 the mental images is also producing, perceiving, remembering images. In this way, there is the in, the, the, another figure is introduced into the whole system of, of, the, of the structure of the image. This is a figure which is much more dynamic than any, at any time before much more functional and dynamic. So, Professor Belting, you have the floor and the computer and the mic. Thank you. Thank you, very Thank much. you for coming. Thank you very much for this introduction. I'm very honored to be here for the first time in my life in Sofia and to talk to you about a subject which uh, was recommended to me to use tonight. I could have chosen other topics, but uh, it was um, mentioned, it was suggested that I go back to Anthropology of Images, which I published more than 10 years ago in Germany, and I would like to make a practical observation on this book. It was published in the moment when I inaugurated a group of 24 doctoral degrees uh, students, pre-doctoral students of nine different disciplines. And we all had uh, the idea that images should be studied in very different contexts. So that was the practical reason why uh, this book was published a little bit hastily. And almost 10 years later, the English edition, which was a very painful process. So we left even out chapters, which I thought are not translatable. And I sacrificed many nice German sentences in order to make <laughs> meaning in English. It was for me very painful. And, I am, and now I'm going back to this subject and uh, also in English. I hope um, I would choose the invitation, gave me an occasion to rethink to reconsider the topic. Also, I would like to add that the first part will be different from the second part. The first part will be without pictures, and the second part with, will, will be with pictures. The question, what is an image? 
arises from the human practice of making images and the other practice of using images. Because images are culturally determined, the answer to this question, what is an image, demands a transcultural, a general validity without neglecting the historical context. Images may be tangible objects which survive in museums and are classified, dated, exhibited as works of art. But their origin has always been in the midst of a social world, whether religious or otherwise. And they therefore are invested with a presence on their own, in which they served as the agents of the collective imaginary. So I invented a new title for this paper, namely Iconic Presence. I will later on explain what I mean with iconic presence. The English language distinguishes images as an overall notion comprising also mental images from pictures which have a material and visible existence in a given physical medium, such as canvas, stone, paper, or the monitor. But this distinction, images and pictures, should not justify any rigid dualism between them. We invest in to interpret pictures with the help of mental images, dreams and myths that we carry with us. The production of pictures is rooted in a body with the capacity of a living medium which dreams and projects its own images into material pictures. The anthropology of images may be regarded as a possible branch of iconology, if we consider iconology as a general picture theory and not just in the narrow meaning of reading artworks, as Erwin Panofsky introduced it. Anthropology may be called a particular kind of iconology, from icon, I don't know whether you have this word in your language, I mean, it's not icons in the church, but, you know, uh, uh, images. Anthropology may be called a particular kind of iconology when it studies the making of pictures, the conditions of their social use, the perception and the memory by humans. Anthropology also may be understood as a critical response to the dominance of media studies, in today's humanities, which sometimes narrow down the history of images to the history of visual media, with its pattern of invention and progress in a way that they follow McLuhan's dictum, the medium is the image. You know, there was a time when there was no photography, and then there was cinema, then there was the internet and the TV. So this I mean with a uh, history of invention and progress. Argued from an anthropological point of view, images have an existence of their own which does not come from and does not end with media technology, but continues to be transferred from one medium to another. I mean, I do not minimize the role of media. We, we can talk about this later. But I wanted to make this difference that iconology is not just media history. Images have, compared to media's constant pressure to be new, a certain anachronism, to use George Didi Übermann's happy notion. So the anachronism is, so to speak, the realm of our own images, which repeat. In short, I regard images as the nomads of media which makes them look new because their media are new. Anthropology also studies a part of mental images. But what are mental images? For the moment, let's say that they create memory, happen in our dreams, dominate our thinking, or serve for a symbolical speech. 
They guide us not only when we recognize, but also when we censor external pictures, which we hate whenever they exert too much pressure on our mental images. We can both worship or destroy pictures due to their place in our own imaginaries. Most of the time, our mental images are dormant. They wait to be awakened by a stimulus from the real world. When, for example, we revisit a place where we have lived, we immediately recognize it, because it has continued to live in our mental images. We own an image of a beloved place, or own the place as an image. The same may be said about all those familiar pictures which evoke our mental images thus confirming the close relations between the pictures seen and pictures remembered as images. If anthropology may be understood as a study of human practice in making pictures and living with pictures, as against ethnology's study of particular culture, then it follows that its subject are images in the broadest sense as against art, which may be regarded as a sub subcategory of images. So in some periods and contexts, this distinction doesn't work. But still, I wanted to emphasize that I do not speak about art tonight, but about images. I explained this um, distinction in a conference about anthropologies of art, which took place in Clark Institute in 2003. Today, even artists strive to act as anthropologists in doing fieldwork in their own culture, thus making a point for a post-colonial critique of former ethnological fieldwork. Fieldwork was very much a situation of the colonial times when Western ethnologists did fieldwork in, remo in remote cultures. Today, this changes in a very interesting way, also with the help of artists. I am no anthropologist by education, but I listen to them. According to Marc Auger, the French anthropologist, anthropology studies, I quote him, the individual imaginary, the individual imaginary, imaginary, our continuous negotiation with collective pictures, the fabrication of pictures, or rather of objects, which serve both as agents of images and as social links, which is very important. He, this was a quotation from his book, La Guerre des Rêves, The War of Images, to which we will come back. But anthropology is in itself only the roof for several variants such as historical anthropology, which for me offers the obvious choice. In France, Serge Krusinski traced the history of colonizing images in Mexico in his book, The War of Images, a theme which he understood as a war with, with images and a war between images. That means between imported Jesuit images of the Spanish and the indigenous images of the locals. Jean-Pierre Vernon initiated at the Collège de France what he called une anthropologie historique de l'image, and what he defined as a, as a quote, as a study of the status of the image, of the imagination, and the imaginary. He has a very interesting configuration for instance, in Myth et Pensée chez les Grecs, my aim was to respond to Vernon's configuration of concepts and artifacts by proposing another configuration, that is, image, medium, and body, as a triad of components that interact, have to interact, in every attempt at picture making. I first went into this direction when I contributed the study Image and Death to a conference about the meaning of death in different religions and cultures of the world. 
My point was to identify death, human death, as one of the roots of human picture making. Body and medium were both involved in the making of sepulchral images, as it was the missing body of the dead in whose place images were installed. But these images, in turn, were in need of an artificial body to occupy the vacant place of the deceased. So there was the dead, the corpse, the disappearance of his body, and on the other hand, the image, which only could be reconstructed with an artificial body. This artificial or replaced body emerged as the image's medium, in the sense that all pictures need a proper agent to acquire visibility for us. To this end, the lost body of the dead was replaced by the fabricated body of the image, or the picture, if you want. The early practice of using live images of the dead testifies to the desire to represent images as the presence of an absence. This is a paradox which exists, the presence of an absence. How can you make an absence present by images, iconic? The presence or visibility of an image, in turn, relies both on the choice of a medium, such as stone, wood, or canvas, and on the gaze of our living body. In their own right, images testify to the absence of what they make present. By virtue of a given medium, their material outfit, they already own the very presence they are meant to transmit. So the, the thought is as follows. This is not new to say the image is the presence of an absence. But the presence was taken for granted. And I said, yes, it's the presence of an image, but it needs another presence, namely its medium, its material visible existence, to make that other presence, the absence, visible. Absence, understood as invisibility, and presence, understood as visibility, are in the final instance a body experience, which images transgress an iconic counteract. Here we grasp the origin of what may be called iconic presence, presence as mental images and embodied in a material picture. When more than 20 years ago I published the book Bild und Kult, Image and Cult, um, very bad translation in German, it functions, in English it doesn't function. I had to choose another title for the English edition. And so I choose the, the new title, Likeness and Presence. Now these are two qualities of the image, which for me very important. Likeness we take so easily for granted. It is just like that. But what is likeness? And in what does likeness consist? This is a much more interesting question than that we usually think. This is one thing. Presence is another thing. In many religious and other social contexts, uh, presence is needed for an authority, for maybe a divine authority, which is made present by an image, which represents, represents that. So there is this, for me, likeness and presence are a concept of vast importance, which need a study of their own. But it's not enough to describe absence only as a loss of presence and thus as a cult of death. There is the whole uh, realm of the divine spirits, of the demons, of the forces of nation, of the gods, which needed presence. That is, all the inhabitants of an invisible world parallel to the world of the living. Here, absence is no loss of presence, but is a necessary condition of conceiving a different world, an invisible world, and the world of the spirits against the real world of the living. It is immediately evident that pictures were the first choice as a tool or agent 
for the invisible powers to come into presence and to allow worship or to create religious imagination. Yet there is one important alternative which now deserves our attention. And maybe I leave out this passage because we can come back to the, which I did not treat in my book at all, which fascinates me more and more. And this is the obsessed body. This is a dancer which is obsessed and which is not just dancing, but he is performing. He is performing somebody else than the performer is. And here is an iconic presence, which is not a material picture, but is what we say the dancing body, but it's not the dancing in our sense. It is the performance of invisible power, which is performed, shown by the whole body. And it would be interesting to relate this case where there is a body who is representing externally and representing images internally against the fabricated picture of the dead where they exist side by side in different cultures. And there is finally a third case. First, of course, the fabricated picture. Second, obsession, trance, and so on. And the third case is monotheism in the Jewish and the Muslim tradition. Here, religion has turned against iconic presence of any kind. But this position already presupposes that there is iconic presence in the religion of the others. So first there is iconic presence in the religion of the others, then Muslim and Jewish culture can react to it. The interdiction of the divine image protects invisibility against the rich tradition of representing invisible gods with, distinguish, with distinguishing visibility of pictures. So if you read the Psalms of the Old Testament, you see that the Psalmist David or not is totally, is all the time ironizing, um, so to speak, contempting the neighboring tribes which have pictures of this and this god and they, they are all idols and we don't like any more idols. So monotheism is a third case where invisibility is not represented by visible pictures but is invisibility is represented against visibility in pictures. One should also note the representation of invisibility by the, of the missing ship picture with scripture and with the geometry of the light in Muslim culture. The choice is rooted in the interview, as you all know, in the interview on Mount Sinai, which Moses had with, Mos which Moses had with the Lord, and where he received the tablet with the ten written commandments, but was admonished to turn his eyes away. So don't look at me, because then you will die but I will give you my scripture. It has been useful to study Muslim societies in Africa where inscribing meaning, to quote a recent exhibition in the Museum of African Art in Washington, where inscribing meaning emerged as a rich tradition of writing and graphic systems in art. So here you see we have a little bit um, walked around the large issue of understanding religious in their materiality, in their visibility, in their material media and images, and the reaction against this. When pictures turn invisibility, and not just that of the death, but about all divine, all immaterial powers into iconic presence, we can speak of a symbolic exchange in the sense which Baudrillard uses in his book L'échange symbolique et la mort. Régis Depré rightly emphasized the historical evolution of public media, but he nevertheless gave equal weight to images that live only in our thinking and in our imagination. He therefore introduced the gaze as a vector for transmitting mental images to material pictures. 
and vice versa. With other words, the gaze as a force that turns a picture into an image and an image into a picture. I myself gave lectures in the Collège de France in 2003, Histoire du regard, the history of the gaze. But when we talk about the gaze, we usually think of perception, recognition, looking at something, interpreting something. But there is one important quality of the gaze which we usually forget. This is the force of animation. So all material pictures, they need animation in order to function as uh, living images. And this uh, animation is usually totally misunderstood as something of animism in primitive tribes. And I'm, again, I'm often furious when this happens because animation is a universal quality and necessity. And our bodies, to conclude, are media by themselves, living media which want to animate lifeless images as their, so to speak, contacts as their, in dialoguing form, as their counters. With other words, pictures rely on two symbolic acts, which both involve our living body. First, the act of fabrication, and second, the act of perception or the act of making them and the other act of using them, the one being the purpose of the other. We must, uh, in anthropological terms, avoid the rigid dualism that so often separates internal from external representation or endogenous from exogenous representation to use the terminology current in neurobiological research today. Our brain certainly is a site of internal representation, but as such it interacts with external representation pictures and thus is capable of controlling what it perceives. To sum up, images are neither removed in the outside world or the wall, nor are they formed in the head alone. They do not exist by themselves, but they happen in the sense that they are formed in the viewer, in the time, and during the act of transmission and the corresponding act of interpretation. Such an interaction requires a complex activity on the side of the believer, the iconophile, and equally on the side of the non-believer, the iconoclast. So this is for me important, not to um, conceive of pictures as something which exists by themselves, nor which exists only in our brains, but something which happens continuously, ever new in a new ways when this encounter happens between the one and the other. I could also rely here uh, on a study by Bernard Stiegler in a very important study, L'image discrète, which he published in the volume he edited with Jacques Derrida, and in which he says, there have never existed physical images, image objet, without the participation of mental images, since an image by definition is one that is seen. Reciprocally, mental images also rely on external images in the sense that they are the retour or the remanence of the latter. The question of the image is always related to that of the trace and of the inscription. In other words, mental images are inscribed in external ones and vice versa. But there are new problems today. The old problems were that material pictures were fixed and static when exhibited, for instance, in the public space. 
thus censoring and correcting our necessarily fleeting imagination. So against the fleeting imagination of the individuals, there is a public picture which forces everybody in the same direction. It was even their purpose to resist the continuous instability and change of our mental disposition. And thus they evoked the collective imaginary embodied in official pictures as control over our individual images. So there was a neat division. Here on this side, the fleeting, subjective, uh, ungraspable, private and individual images. On the other hand, pictures which were created to have power over people in the good or in the bad sense. We all know that, not only from socialist time, but anyway. They could also trigger a form of resistance, such pictures, and, and protection. But iconoclasm only succeeds in destroying their medium support, and thus their material existence. By depriving a picture of its physical outfit, iconoclasm aims also to deprive it of its public presence and its political or religious authority. Destruction in such a case is as symbolic as the original installation. It is directed against the image, but in fact damages only the stone or bronze. The mere elimination of a public picture cannot guarantee its removal from our minds. But a crisis happens in the digital age. The new problems are to be seen in the fact that pictures in the digital age have become as transitory and fleeting as our own images were forever. Nam Jun Paik was, uh, he was a great ironic, so he, he was happy, he says, that the pictures finally are like that, like our brain pictures circulating all the time. But this was half ironic. The new situation is best exemplified by photography, analogous photography, digital photography. But the new problems are related to the changes in our interaction with that condition of pictures which I have called medium, in the sense of vector agent dispositive. The new realm of digital fictionalization deprives us of our inborn capacity, capacity to distinguish media from images, a capacity to understand a picture neither as a material object nor as a real body, but as a third condition of visibility. Most of the new images have no material substance. They obscure their technical condition and lacks this distinction which separated external pictures from internal images. So they obscure this neat line between the ones and the others. This situation also means the end of traditional iconoclasm because iconoclasm against the internet is almost impossible unless you, it's a private activity. Marc Auger speaks of a crisis of meaning that has invaded the territory of symbols and institutions via the new media of fiction. The new dimension of fictionalization has altered the relation of so circulation between the individual imaginaire, such as a dream, the collective imaginaire, such as a myth, and finally fiction. I quote, we all have the feeling to be colonized without really knowing by whom. It was easier to identify the colonizers and the colonized in the past, as for example, during the invasion of Mexico by Catholicism, which even changed the dreams of the Indians and forced the Indians to identify with the Spanish pictures even in their dreams and visions. 
Roger concludes that the fictionalization of the present tense, so everything is present tense, but also fiction, the present tense as fiction, that this process substitutes both the traditional mythification of the past, the mythic past, the real past, the important past, and that also of the future. The same process produces an equally fictional self, incapable, incapable to define its reality and its identity by an effective relation to others. But this is not meant here you now as a kind of sad description of what happens to all of us, terrible, and changes the history of images. No, no, on the contrary. The human being always are transforming what they are receiving, suffering. So I think the human user will develop completely new capacities to cope with this situation, which is a new media situation. And he will cope with the fictionalization of the world, I hope. But the description of the present situation to conceive, I, I come to the end of the first part, and there will be a short part with pictures. But the description of the present situation to conceive iconology is incomplete if we don't consider the changes which globalization brings about in our experience of images. On the one hand, images are circulating everywhere due to the same worldwide media. On the other hand, they are not the same images, but as shown by artists worldwide, are marked by traditions of image making, which differ from our experience in education. With other words, there was a very familiar imperialism, not only of Western colonization, but also of Western conception, that we speak about the image, as if there was with one image and the picture or something. So the whole terminology has an inborn universalism in modern times. And this is now problematized by new participants, where new studies of icons, of images and pictures are coming about. I mentioned a few of them. There is um, François Julien, the French uh, philosopher and uh, classicist. La grande image n'a pas de forme ou du non objet par la peinture in China. So he, he discusses the question how Chinese tradition used to define images. Or this, in the same study, in the same relation, by Wu Hung the Chinese scholar who now teaches in Chicago. The double screen is uh, the book called Medium and Representation in Chinese Painting. Or another case, there was a Chinese doctorate in Göteborg in Sweden by C. Hahn uh, with the title, a Chinese word, 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 a Chinese word on image and the Chinese thought of images. So here you see, we have new participants to whom we have to listen. And we have to see whether our terminology and our conception in the most general terms are still valid or have to be adapted or, uh, so to speak, respond, respond is, I think, the word, to theories which force us to um, think not only in Western modern terms, but also in human general terms, if that is possible. Maybe it's not possible, but this is a very new situation which is interesting. In this case, I would like to add that art, contemporary art, is ahead of iconology. There was a conference recently in... Um, I think in Vietnam and then in Australia with the title Pour une histoire transculturelle de l'art for a transcultural history of art. This conference followed this, one of the last congresses, international congresses of the history of art in Melbourne 
2008 with the title Crossing Cultures, a very revolutionary uh, book which I recommend to everybody who wants to study the situation of art today. Uh, 700 speakers participated at this Congress in Melbourne. And I think uh, this Congress also made it clear that art is not only the matter of art historians or art critics or art curators. It is also progressively the matter of anthropologists. And to this situation, a new uh, conference also in Paris has given a kind of a key word with the title Cannibalism Disciplinaire, Disciplinary Cannibalisms, when art history and anthropology meet. Also in Karlsruhe, we did several conferences of a pre-doctorate mostly, which we called Global Studies. And it turns out that in terms of contemporary art and contemporary artists, art historians and anthropologists were facing each other with completely different disciplinary skills and expectations, but with the same objects, absolutely the same objects. So I think this is a situation which is very interesting on the one hand, but since I do not speak about art today, I just say there is something moving in which philosophy and terminology might follow. And uh, so, my reflections on anthropology images has, as you can see, an open end. It's a preliminary conclusion, because everything which we have to do today must be preliminary if we are sincere. Now I will show a few pictures in order to confuse you more. <laughs> 